I dare to hope, having deconditioned myself from my Catholic childhood and gone through existentialism and all that, now I dare to hope that maybe there is some kind of existence beyond the grave. Well, first of all, let me say I don't know, but then here's what I think. Uh, the model that I've always carried in my head is of a target, like a bullseye. And at the center of the bullseye is the dimethyl tryptamine high dose experience, which, you know, even though I've spent my whole career raving about how strange it is, I always hit low. I mean, it is beyond description. Language fails. Your language, my language, everybody's language. And as you move out from that, maybe the next circle out is uh, high-dose ayahuasca followed by high-dose psilocybin, or maybe those two are reversed. And then further out, uh, LSD. And then further out, things like 2CB. And then yet further out, things like uh, ecstasy. And what's leaving the picture are, first of all, intense three-dimensional hallucinations, then intense two-dimensional hallucinations, and the more exotic transformations of the mental state. But I have the feeling that we're always aiming for the center of this mandala. Somebody else might have a different model of consciousness. Uh, Roland Fisher had uh, a toroidal model and various states of arousal. But to my mind, if you raise the dose of any psychedelic, it becomes more and more like DMT. You have to take over 500 micrograms of LSD for it to be like DMT. Very few people these days do that much acid because it brings a lot of physical stuff with it. Uh, ayahuasca at moderate doses is the classical hallucinogen of Amazonian shamanism that you've all read about but double that dose and it becomes indistinguishable from DMT. Same with psilocybin. A, uh, if a five gram trip is a classic psilocybin trip, an eight gram trip is like a DMT trip. So now some people are saying of alpha salvinorine that it's much stronger than DMT. It's much more frightening and bizarre um, just to save my sanity, I choose not to believe that. Uh, because I, if there's, I've been saying for years, if there's something stronger than that, I don't want to know about it. <laughs> because that definitely pushed me as far as I wanted to go. I, my son, I think, has more experience with all of this than anybody else I know. And I said to him, where would you put it? And he said, it's almost as strong as DMT. And so it's, it, it's sort of like that. But then over this set of values and comparisons I've just made, you have to overlay the fact that like your blue eyes, your height, your body weight, your intelligence, and everything else about you that makes you unique, your uh, inherited... Uh, 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 allotment of drug synapses is unique. And this is why some people are sensitive to drugs, some people insensitive, some people extremely sensitive. And one of the things about exploring consciousness with substances is you have to sort of learn what works for you you may have gotten the idea from hanging out with the wrong people that the way you explore drugs is by doing as many as possible and in as many combinations as possible. I couldn't do that. I have never done that and I can't do that. My body just can't take it. Uh, 
if I want a more intense drug experience, I take more of one drug. Uh, but part of exploring this area is to learn what works for you. For example, uh, the most dramatic and easy to understand example, I think, is cannabis. Most people, after a preliminary brush with cannabis, which may last years, tend to decide that it somehow interferes or that it they have memory problems or feelings of social paranoia or so, and abandon it. Some small percentage of, of people experience no short-term memory loss and basically can't live without it. I, I speak from first-hand knowledge of this condition. So uh, learning what works for you is, uh, is very important and then pushing that push that uh, to its limits. What fascinates me, just I'll just unload my personal opinion on you, are the tryptamine hallucinogens. Uh, I always found LSD too, what I call, uh, abrasively psychoanalytical. I don't want to endlessly reflect on my childhood upbringing and whether I'm a good or a bad person. I mean, I'll do a little bit of that, but I think I got that under control. I, I, I'm, I'm not interested in myself in quite the way some people are interested in themselves. What I'm interested in, and what's always been the holy grail for me, are visual hallucinations. And people have said, you're, you're a nut on this subject. But the reason I'm so into visual hallucinations is because when I'm seeing something that I could not previously have even imagined, then I am completely convinced I'm in the presence of an other because I couldn't think that up, and yet I'm looking at it. Uh, low doses of psychedelics or moderate doses of psychedelics transform the quality of thought you think faster, think deeper, think odder, think broader, but you need more for that to burst through into, into hallucination. And that always has fascinated me as a, it's just, I guess, in my personality. I was thinking some months ago about the books that have really influenced me in my life. And, you know, we try to make a respectable list that makes us seem profound. So, you know, Moby Dick, Finnegan's Wake, Whitehead. Yeah, say, okay, that's the public list. What are the real books? Well, Bartholomew Cubbins and the 500 Hats, so that was the biggie. But a really important book for me was a little book that Aldous Huxley wrote almost as a throwaway. I'm sure he barely gave it a thought. Uh, it's a book called The Art of Seeing. Seeing. And it basically, the message of this book can be given in one sentence. Pay attention to what your eyes are telling you. The eyes are it. And it's the visual thing that is so thrilling, so sexy, so infinitely deep. And in that book, Huxley tells you how to look at a painting by basically clear your mind, open your eyes, stand still. That's very important when viewing paintings. Stand still and let it come in. And then he gave advice. And, you know, this is advice which I've seen acted out in both of my children. Incredibly simple advice in the world of child rearing and incredibly important. And the advice was, draw from nature, literally, with a pencil. Draw things, because drawing things forces you to look at them. And don't draw from pictures. If you want to draw a bowl of fruit, get a bowl of fruit. And then what you look at is you see how, you say, oh, I see, when an object is red, its shadows are not black, its shadows are deep pink. 
And when an object has this curvature, then it spreads light around itself like this. And as you learn to look, this is a very impersonal process. You're not thinking about your childhood traumas or any of that stuff. You're really getting into the world. And this is how the world can communicate back to you. The world is something to, to look at. And th that attitude in the presence of psychedelics will throw open a cornucopia of riches to you. Did you want to say something? No, I was just curious if you said what about Oh, well, I, sh I whenever I, I mean, cannabis is in a different category. I mix cannabis with air, with light, with being awake, with being asleep. There was a period in my life when I used to awaken at 3 a.m. in order to smoke because I couldn't go from 11.30 to 6 uh, uh, without it. I mean, granted, I was in Asia and the rules were different. Uh, no, I, I don't know what life is like without cannabis. I hear there is such a thing. <laughs> but, uh, no, what I mean is, you know, I, I know people who say, well, we had a really far out time Saturday night. Uh, we uh, did 120 milliliters of ketamine and followed it with uh, ecstasy a half hour later, and then we broke out the nitrous, and somebody had a little 5-MeO with them, and, uh, and, I'm, and then I say, how was it? I say, far out. <laughs> And I don't doubt it for a minute. Uh, but, well, one, I think I always want, I don't want to go any place that I can't find my way back to, because I might want to show somebody. And, you know, uh, it's sort of like the multibody problem in mathematics. You know, you can calculate every point in a system if there are only three body, uh, two bodies, but you only have to add a third before it becomes beyond calculation. And drug synergies are an absolutely unexplored area. You cannot go to the medical literature and find any papers on what happens when you combine LSD with 2CB. There isn't such a paper on this planet. So if you're going to do that, just know that nobody has ever been there before. And I don't mean intellectually, I mean physiologically. Uh, I, I don't know very much about this, the death of this writer who calls himself D.M. Turner, but uh, he did die. And his book, his best-known book, is a book that I felt was completely irresponsible because it advocated these multiple synergistic drug doses, stuff like I just said, 2CB plus ketamine plus nitrous plus E plus this plus that. That's not how I would do it. I say, you know, single pure substances, and if you're unsatisfied with the experience, as Dr. Leary used to say, when in doubt, double the dose. But he didn't say, when in doubt, empty the medicine cabinet. Uh, just double the dose. Thank you. And Tim was a pretty reckless and wild ass kind of guy. So if he took that position, I think we don't have to be ashamed to line up behind that. Yeah. Ketamine. It has a lot of enthusiasts. Um, first thing, the most effective way to do it is by injection. Automatically, this raises flags of alarm for me. I just somewhere picked up the idea that banging things is a bad idea. Um, but let's move past that, because it can be snorted. And uh, anyway, uh, ke ketamine is what's called a disassociative anesthetic. It is not an alkaloid. It is a veterinary anesthetic. In other words, if you have a racehorse and you need to put it, wrap its tendon or work on it in some way, this is the drug of choice. Um, I cannot deny 
that the experiences that I had, and I only had five, were very, very interesting. Uh, I always did it in the presence of a physician, and I always did quite, as I understand it, quite high doses. In other words, I did around 140 milliliters. Uh, mil- yeah, milliliters. Uh, one of the things about ketamine is it's active over a huge range. Some people who roll it into their lifestyle tend to do small doses like 40, 50, 60. When used as an anesthetic uh, in pediatric surgery and stuff like that, 600 milliliters IV push, that would be like being hit by a tra- freight train moving at 10 times the speed of sound. You would never know what hit you. Um, uh, it's a kind, for me, I'm just speaking subjectively, uh, it was a sort of empty space. It was a light-filled space, and the metaphor that came to me was it's like a new skyscraper, and they don't have any tenants. So there are these endless hallways lit by fluorescent lights and wonderful water coolers every 300 feet, but there's nobody there. And uh, I talked to Rupert about this because one of the things we've kicked around over the years is the idea that drugs are like morphogenetic fields. And so, for instance, when you take psilocybin, it takes you. And in a sense, you are participating in every psilocybin trip anybody ever had. And because it was taken for thousands of years by Mesoamerican shamans, it's been decorated by them, in a sense. It has their mark on it. And so the, the morphogenetic field is extremely stable. Nothing you can do in there. You may be able to carve your initials on a picnic table or something, but not, you're not going to be able to make major changes in that landscape. But suppose we have a, suppose you're a drug chemist, and suppose you read one of Sasha's papers where he tosses out the thought that the O methylation in the four position of the trimethoxy isomer of the this and that might be hallucinogenic, and you make it. Nobody has ever taken this drug. It's a synthetic drug. You have made it, and now you're going to take it. And in a sense, if you come down saying, this was an incredibly beautiful visionary experience, the next person is very likely to have a beautiful visionary experience. If you come down saying it was nightmarish and I felt bugs crawling under my skin and stuff like this, what's happening is the morphogenetic field is crystallizing around this drug. And the feeling I had with ketamine was it's really pretty undefined territory. Um, The one thing I learned from ketamine and I actually have, I have to give it credit for this, is I got so loaded on that stuff that I lost the concept loaded. And that's never happened to me before. I couldn't, I, I couldn't understand what was happening because I couldn't remember what being high is. And so here I am, And I sort of come into awareness, and I say, what is this? And then the answer is, who knows? Next question, who's asking? Answer, who knows? And so I just look at it for a while, and then suddenly, out of left field, this aha experience, I must be stoned. And then it's like everything crystallized, said, that's it! I'm a human being. 
I took a drug. I'm lying on the floor. This is a trip. He said, oh, this is a trip. Gotcha. Now I know what's happening. We're having a trip. Okay, let's have the trip. And, but until I got that sorted out, it was like the biggest, huh? Uh, so I, I would not, um, I, I don't prefer it because m part of my ethic I guess you would say, is that you should be able to communicate your experiences. It's almost like an obligation. It's like if you go fishing on our lake, you should give some of the fish to the village. If you go fishing and catch a lot of fish and eat them out in the boat and come back with nothing but bones for the village, then this is kind of bad behavior. So. Uh, I stay clear of ketamine. I have a, a bias that used to be stronger uh, against synthetic substances. Uh, uh, but again, uh, in fairness, I have to say um, these drugs, people have different kinds of experiences. Like I've said to people on ketamine, you don't really hallucinate in the way that I want to hallucinate. People say, oh, no, I had fantastic, it was beyond DMT. Uh, so again, the individual thing. Um, and then what's the final thing? And then just physical things about ketamine. I don't, I don't like a drug so strong that the house could burn down around you and you would never bat an eye. And that could certainly happen on ketamine. At height, you have not a clue. They could remove your head, and you would not bat an eye. Uh, and the other thing I noticed about ketamine is it really sticks to your ribs. In other words, the experience lasts an hour. You come down, but the next day, you're driving on the freeway and comes a wave where you say, oh my God, you know, what is this? And I think it, it uh, sequesters in fatty tissue or something. And so that, that makes it a, a little dicey. I uh, hope I didn't rain on anybody's parade here. The people who are into it are passionately into it. I accused one guy one time of being a monopharmophile. <laughs> I said, my God, you know, you won't take a drink, you won't have a hit, you won't do, but this stuff, <laughs> five times a day. <laughs> well, I'm as interested as you are. I don't have any special information. I did talk earlier in the weekend about this model of the hyperdimensional object intruding into three-dimensional space-time and through the miracle of metabolism, wrapping matter around itself for a few years, and then when the hyperdimensional form retracts out of this lower dimensional matrix, the matter that it's organized simply falls apart. Um, I like that model. Uh, my DMT trips, as I, I think I mentioned this too, I've given it to some Tibetan guys, and they, they said, you know, y you can't go further than that and return. What he, what he actually said was, it's the lesser lights. The lesser lights appear at the beginning of the bardo. Mm -hmm. um, the, the thing about DMT, and we didn't talk about it much this weekend, is that it is an inhabited space. Um, a huge percentage of the people who take it encounter entities of some sort in there, not entities like wombats and foxes, and, but entities with intelligence of some sort, with language of some sort. Well, remember I talked about the principle of parsimony, of preferring the simplest explanation first? Well, when you have a drug which conveys you into an inhabited space, even the simplest explanation is going to be pretty baroque. Uh, some people, including myself, wanted to leap to the conclusion, well, these must be the aliens. We finally found their hive. 
It isn't under the Atlantic Trench. It isn't inside Mount Everest. It's they're hiding inside this organic molecule. Uh, but I think in service of the principle of parsimony, preferring the simplest explanation, these things must be human souls. Uh, it's easier for me to believe in the human soul than to believe in a colony of extraterrestrials mm -hmm. camped inside an alkaloid. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not that easy for me to believe in human souls. But still, the feeling you have from these things is one of immense affection for humanity. That wouldn't come from a diplomatic mission from Zenebel Ganubi. This intense love, weird, uh, and so I dare to hope, having deconditioned myself from my Catholic childhood and gone through existentialism and all that, now I dare to hope that maybe there is some kind of existence beyond the grave. One of the funny feelings, there are a number of, how could you call it, thematic layers in the DMT experience. But one of the thematic layers is weird as this place is that you burst into, it's somebody very strange worked very hard to produce a place that they thought would be reassuring to a human being. And the analogy, it's stronger than an analogy, the feeling that comes through is this is like a maternity ward. I, it's as though you're being born. And these marvelous, self-transforming, Fabergé, crystalline 4D toys that they're handing out in this space may be, to them, nothing more than the equivalent of those uh, extruded plastic geometric shapes that we hang on a string over a bassinet. And if you ask a child psychologist, why do we do this? They say, well, it uh, coordinates the child's ability to see spatial and so forth and so on. It's very like that. You have been born into an alien world, and the only thing you can do is gape basically gape in utter amazement and uh, everyone is surrounding you and uh, and they're saying you know w welcome it's okay be happy well then if it is like a maternity ward then one can know as much about whatever universe that is as one could deduce about this universe from looking at the four walls of a maternity ward in a small hospital in, say, Salinas. In other words, if you were to actually die rather than smoke DMT, then, apparent, then if we follow this model, then you would be in that place, but there would be no going back to this world after five minutes. Instead, there would be the next five minutes in that place, followed by the next Five minutes, and I can tell within hours you would be beyond the reach of all human I anything you have ever called humanness or thought of. In other words, this isn't a world where one comes back and whispers in the ears of people and bangs doors in the middle of the night. It appears like once out of the body, this incredibly enfolded and compacted field called the soul begins to unfold into its death rite, I suppose you could say. And quickly one would become incomprehensible to this world. And all that is retained is the affection for, for us in our limited um, situation. Uh, of course, thinking along these lines, I've looked at the literature of near-death experience. What those people are describing is something far more mundane than a DMT trip. Either they are dumbing down 
the DMT trip and suppressing the oddness of it, or they're having a quite different experience because what's being said in the near-death thing, generally, generally, is a tunnel and then loving relatives, reassuring and familiar people. The DMT thing is a tunnel, but it isn't loving relatives waiting at the end. It's a welcoming committee of professional midwives, and they they help you through. So I would suggest, without great heat, that if we want to study the near-death and after-death experience, that actually you come far closer to dying, whatever that means, on DMT than you do in drownings and things like that. Well, any situation can be looked at from a point of view that reveals the whole fractal. In other words, what it's saying is experience is holographic on one level, but linearly sequential on another level. In a way, this leads into, or this is a continuation of this discussion of death, because if we leave off the historical modeling and turn toward the modeling of an individual life with the time wave, then again, there is a message of hope. It says the most novel and amazing thing that will ever happen to you is the last thing that will ever happen to you. And I would like to believe that. I would like to believe that we gather our experience, we become wiser, we meet people, life becomes more novel, we have children, they have children, we have success, we have failure. Our li- you just get, if you're living right, your life should just get more and more baroque, beautiful, complicated, mysterious, and then you die. And then it really gets interesting. Uh, that's what I'm, that's what this all seems to want us to believe. Let's put it that way. This is def- and then people say, well then if, if the world is fractal, if then is it not true that the evolution of an individual could be extrapolated to be the evolution of the whole system. And then that leads to the mildly unsettling possibility that what this great transition we're moving toward is is not uh, T1 for everybody, but D1 for everybody. In other words, death. Death is the thing that really stirs us. We don't know what it is. We don't know whether we're supposed to flee from it or race toward it. Uh, and people say, well, then, is it possible that, just to take the date 2012 as a mark, is it possible that everyone would die? It's possible. Uh, I've looked a lot at asteroid impactors because the people who study these things know that this is not an act of God or a miracle, that this happens. It has happened, it will happen, and it happens on different scales from things like Meteor Crater in Arizona 50,000 years ago. Everything within 800 miles of that impact died instantly 50,000 years ago. But 65 million years ago, an object the size of Manhattan impacted in the Gulf of Campeche, and nothing on this planet larger than a chicken walked away from that. Well, now, if you talk about ecological disaster, there's never been one like that in the history of the planet. Thousands, tens of thousands of species died. Entire orders of animals were wiped out. The continents were rearranged. But guess what? The flowering plants, of which we are so fond, and our own dear selves, of which we are even more fond, would never have had a chance to insinuate themselves into the evolutionary life of this planet had there not been that clearing out of the reptilian climax. 
So then you look at this and you say, well, was this the greatest mass extinction in history or the greatest leap forward for biology in the history of the planet? And the answer is, it was both. Out of enormous death comes an enormous surge in the domain of organic novelty. Uh, I prefer to think that it is not a planetary catastrophe or a mass dying. And I'll, I'll tell you why. And this is a place, this is, now we're working from the notebooks. In other words, this is not prepared for public consumption. This is something I meditate on in the baths. I can't help but notice that as novelty increases in time, according to this model, that the spatial domain of its focus narrows. So, for instance, in the early phase of the time wave, the, the stars are condensing and the galaxies are forming. We could say that the entire universe is moving toward novelty. But once carbon chemistry appears, the cycles of fusion in stars and production of heavy elements and things like this are stabilized. And the domain of novelty becomes biology. And for a billion and a half years, biology evolves and adumbrates its forms and moves from the prokaryotic to the eukaryotes, to the multicellular, the conquest of the land begins. But then, uh, with the emergence of language using and tool using higher primates, in a sense, novelty leaves the domain of organic life. And organic life becomes metastable and evolution and mutation happens. But where the action has moved to is in to the epigenetic domain entirely defined on this planet by human activities. And so the human beings are the carriers of novelty. And that has gone on until about, um, oh, pick a number, but basically 3,000 to 2,500 years ago. And then the novelty seems to concentrate itself in southern Europe. The Greeks take some kind of step that no other people have ever taken. You know, even today, if you go around the world and visit tribal people and ask to see their art, they show you, if you ask to see depictions of human beings, they show you symbolic depictions of human beings. That's what an African mask is. That's what a Sepik river carving is. These are symbols of human beings. The Greek mind crossed an invisible boundary. And somebody said, let's take a block of marble or some clay and let's not symbolize a human being. Let us make a perfect topological simulacrum of a human being, a face that looks like a face, flesh that looks like flesh. It, it was as though the Greek consciousness rose to the surface and left the unconscious behind and the eyes were opened and no longer saw through symbolic filters, but instead said, nature in and of itself. This is the foundation for science and art as we know it. So the novelty then was largely in the hands, and largely, I'm rushing here, exceptions are obvious, in the hands of what we call the Greco-Roman mind. And, uh, and so it has been for a couple of thousand years. We'll then pick a number, a uh, hundred years or so ago, it, it further contracted the novelty. It further contracted itself into the high-tech industrial democracies. And now it has further retracted. One of the problems we're having in our society is there's a bifurcation going on in society. 
part of us are going with the new novel technologies that knit us together and make us dimensionless telepathic creatures through the internet and some people are digging in their heels and saying oh no no beyond newspapers I can't go uh, and so those people are being left behind they are practicing old style culture in an equilibrium state so now it isn't even all of the high-tech populations of the industrial democracies as we get closer to 2012, if this process uh, proceeds, then the source of novelty will constrict even further. And I guess it may eventually come down to one or two people or a group of people, and maybe those people will make a machine. And then the machine will be the source of the novelty, and all of us will be put out to the pasture of equilibrium and maintain the rest of the world as it was, but the novelty will have focused to some kind of incredibly intense point. And so looking at it from that model, it's hard to see how it could be an asteroid impact or something like that because that would affect all biology, all geology. It would completely violate this long-standing tendency of the novelty to um, uh, concentrate itself. Well, now the Buddhists have an interesting perspective that maybe has something to do with this. There are many schools of Buddhism, and I don't want to get into the that, but uh, there are schools which hold the following doctrine, that if a single person could attain enlightenment, then all sentient beings in the cosmos would attain enlightenment instantly. In other words, that only one person or one being has to break through the boundary for the entire state system to collapse and rearrange itself. It's December 21st, 2012, and through the worldwide VM, VRML hookup of the internet, everybody with an IQ above 10 has gathered in the great collective space to witness the first attempt to send a human being through time and uh, at the World Temporal Studies Institute at La Chirera in the Amazon, uh, the president of so-and-so makes a speech, the lady time traveler makes a speech, she straps on her helmet, she steps into the machine, the fanfare for the common man is played, a button is pushed, and uh, off she goes into the future. Now, what has always been put against time travel schemes is what's called the grandfather paradox. And this is easy to understand. It goes like this. If time travel were possible, I could travel back in time and <clears throat> kill my grandfather. If I did that, I wouldn't exist, so I couldn't do it. Therefore, there's a closed loop of paradox. Therefore, time travel is impossible. I put this to the mushroom, and it said, well, uh, time travel is possible, but you can only travel backward in time as far as the moment of the invention of the first time machine. You can't travel further back in time than that because there were no time machines before that. So it's a kind of barrier. Well, so then I thought, mm. so then here was my model of what would happen when the lady tempo knot sails off into the future. Let's forget about her and ask the question, what happens next in our world? And my first guess was what happens next is thousands and thousands of time machines arrive from all points in the future. They have come back through time to witness the first time machine take off. 
It's as though you had a Piper Cub that you could fly to Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, to that windy morning in late December when the Brothers Wright rolled it out of their bicycle shop and fired her up. And then I said, well, but wait a minute. We haven't dealt with the grandfather paradox. One of these time machines from the distant future on its way to the first time flight could stop off and kill the grandfather of the driver of that time machine. And we haven't gotten anywhere at all. So then I, I produced a slightly more complicated model, but, at the, but it works. And so here, here's what it is. It's that because the future is not what we think it is, uh, well, here's, a, here's a, a, a metaphor which makes it more clear. In this world that we're living in right now, we have people such as Bill Gates and his research and development teams, and we have people such as the upriver people in Don that I spent time with, bare-assed people living at a very minimal cultural level. Gates and his people and the, this Amazon tribe occupy the same planet and the same moment in history. But who is influencing who? Very few people in the world are taking up the Amazonian lifestyle or point of view. Millions and millions of people are going Gates direction and more and more will. So what I concluded from that is that advanced states of culture tend to squeeze out or mitigate less advanced states of culture. Now let's return to the time flight. What happens when the lady at Temponaut goes into the future is not that time machines arrive from all over the future. What happens is that the entire rest of the history of the universe happens instantly. In other words, a future, evolutionary developments, conquest of the galaxy, vast technologies that allow star flight and wormhole travel and all that, the fruits of all that are delivered instantly to our doorstep in 2012. I call it the God Whistle model. In other words, we end the whole thing. We, we collapse the state vector and everything goes into a state of novelty. And it's, a, and what happens then, I think, is, uh, the universe becomes entirely made of light. This is a sort of the cherry on the cake. You know that there is, uh, something in physics called the principle of parity. This is that particles can appear out of nothingness as long as they appear in pairs such that after a certain period of time, the two pairs and not the, the two portion, the, the members of the pair encounter and annihilate each other. And when this happens, physicists say parity is conserved. Now, it's known in quantum physics that there is a phenomenon called vacuum fluctuation. Uh, vacuum fluctuation is a situation where in absolutely empty space, suddenly out of the quantum subspace, particles jump into existence. They follow trajectories, they encounter each other, they annihilate each other, Parity is conserved, and so it's okay. It's okay. Well, so then you talk to these quantum physicists and you say, well, well, how large can one of these vacuum fluctuations be? And they say, well, m most of the, they last milliseconds, nanoseconds. You say, well, is there a theoretical upper limit on the size of a vacuum fluctuation dictated by theory? And they say, no, no, no. It's simply that the longer the fluctuation lasts, the rarer it is. 
So, in other words, the longer a fluctuation lasts, the less likely you are to encounter one. Well, then you say, well, is it possible that this entire universe is such a vacuum fluctuation? You say, well, yes, but that would be very rare to have such a long one. You say, well, hell, you only need one. <laughs> Calculating the probability of a unicate event is a fool's game. I mean, it's either 100% sure or zero sure. It's, uh, so, uh, so here is a model, and I took this from the Swedish physicist Hans Alfven, who hasn't gotten enough credit, but who's really a very interesting thinker. Imagine that the universe is this kind of vacuum fluctuation a 17 billion year long vacuum fluctuation. Well, what it means then is that at the Big Bang, not one universe was born, but two. And they sailed off into super spaces and have no connectivity with each other, or they have Bell non-local connectivity or something. But anyway, they are distinctly separate. and. But they are unbeknown to each other on a collision course with each other. Parity must be conserved eventually. And a model like this holds open the possibility of the instantaneous transformation of the entire cosmos. Because the collision of these two universes would not occur in three-dimensional space it would occur in a higher dimensional space. So this cosmological model holds out the possibility that all matter in the universe could be instantaneously canceled in this encounter with the antimatter twin that was born at the beginning of the cosmos. OK, if you're still following, we're almost to pay dirt. Every particle known to physics, possesses an antiparticle, which is locked into this parity-conserving thing I've laid out for you, with one exception, one astonishing and amazing exception. The photon has no antiparticle. There is no antiphoton. So this universe, that is on a collision course with itself in hyperspace, at the moment of the conservation of parity, all matter vanishes. And what is left is a universe made entirely of light. And we have no model, for, or I have no model, uh, for a universe made of light. There would be no gravity, because gravity is a property of matter. Such a universe could be modeled. And then the question is, well, then what would happen to forms? What would happen to your body, my body, this planet? The answer is, no one can know. But it is very interesting that the esoteric traditions of nearly every religion uh, talk about light a great deal. Talk about ascent to the light, cultivation of the light, the after-death vehicle as a thing made of light. So uh, I just put this out here because it occurred to me. My imagination in an effort to make the assumptions of novelty theory congruent with the known laws of physics, I discovered, you know, this sounds like wild hair stuff, but no violation of the known laws of physics is involved in this scenario. So perhaps what enlightenment is, is it happens to an entire universe when it drops its matter and antimatter out, uh, out of its structure, and it becomes entirely made of light. That would certainly fulfill uh, the novelty theory. Anyway, that's enough of that malarkey. Well, you see, the way the novelty theory is structured is you have this wave, uh, and it is iterated on different scales. And iteration, if you have a given level, let's call it A, 
above A is a larger level that is A times 64. Below A is a smaller level that is 1 64th of A. And wherever you are in the hierarchy, this is true. Levels above, 64 times larger. Levels below, 64 times smaller. Well, modern astrophysics says they're arguing about it right now, but the universe is between, is under 20 billion years old. Everybody agrees on that. And the question is, is it 9, 12, 13, 14? But it's under 20. The, the time wave has a cycle, the largest cycle I have found necessary, except for the prime number research, is a 72 billion year cycle. So let's call that the top cycle, the A level. A 72 billion year cycle, plenty of time to, for the universe to evolve to its present state. Below that level, is a cycle 1 64th that size. What would that be? Roughly 1.2 billion years. At the initiation of that cycle, uh, uh, I don't know, some dramatic thing happens in biology. Below it is another cycle. Uh, if, if the B level is 1.2, two billion years, then the next level is one sixty-fourth of that. I think it's roughly 275 million years. Next cycle, um, divided by 64, whatever it is, uh, 750,000 years. Uh, next cycle, and you see where I'm going. Well, eventually you get to a cycle that's 4,306 years in duration. That is basically the cycle of late history. I mean, certainly there was history before 4,000 years, but the continuous march of global civilization over the last 4,000 years. Well, then the next cycle down is only 67 years long. And I mentioned it last night, from 1945 to 2012. Each cycle begins with a bang, literally. Uh, below the 67-year cycle, there is a 384-day cycle. And, I, and that, is, that will run from late 2011, somewhere in November 2011, to the end of 2012. <clears throat> and I call that the year of the jackpot. It's a 13-month year. But the entire history of the universe will be reprised in that 384-day period. Well, then comes a six-day cycle. By this time, either I will have gently bowed out or the entire world will be aware of what is happening because the novelty will be so intense. Imagine a six-day cycle in which the entire previous 67-year 4,306 year, na, 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 up to the top level, are all being compressed and replayed in six days. Well, then comes the hour and 35 minute cycle. Then comes the minute and a half cycle. Then comes the 1.3 second cycle. Now, at that point, 1.3 seconds, if we assume that the cycles cannot be iterated beyond the level of Planck's constant, which is 6.55 times 10 to the minus 23rd erg seconds. The way for you to think of that is as a jiffy. Uh, it's, the, it's the grain of the universe. We don't feel the need to go be, to s discuss lengths of time shorter than that because there aren't lengths of time shorter than that. Time comes in those packets of that size. Uh, well, if you're at 1.3 seconds cycle, you still have 13 cycles to go through before you reach the realm of Planck's constant. And you have come through 13 cycles. So the universe is only half done 
1.3 seconds before its end. That's why asking what will happen in 2012 is preposterous. The mind fails. Half of the universe's evolutionary unfolding will occur in the last few milliseconds of its existence because of the asymptotic acceleration of the expression of novelty. So it's this thing which began very gently, very stately, the march of the atoms, you know, the condensation of the stars and the galaxies, the emergence of biology, the emergence of higher animals, the emergence of... and just into then a screeching photo finish where all this stuff is bundled together, squeezed together, connected, transformed, lifted into higher dimensions. And see, this is not a process we can take responsibility for or (laughs) discuss our guilt or innocence. This is the cosmos itself tearing loose from its previous constraints and moving ever faster toward ever greater freedom with ever more appetite and momentum until it is it achieves its goal, which is infinite novelty throughout all space and time, holographic connectedness, God-mindedness, you know, whatever your vocabulary is, yeah. Oh, yeah, this is a completely legitimate move. I mean, it's mind-boggling to think of this in human scales of time, that half of the universe's becoming occurred in a few milliseconds But dig the fact that is the position of orthodox physics as we sit here. It's simply that they say it happened at the beginning. I say it'll happen at the end. What they're saying in physics now is that the universe came in, the Big Bang occurred, and then some, you know, a few nanoseconds after the Big Bang, there was this thing called the inflationary expansion phase. It lasted a few nanoseconds, and in those few nanoseconds, the universe became several order, uh, tens of orders of magnitude larger than it was. So it's a it's a legitimate move in physics, however counterintuitive it may seem uh, on the human scale. Yeah. Have you looked at the many worlds? Well, the problem with the many worlds theory is it just it violates the principle of parsimony. In other words, that is not the simplest explanation. That's an inc- Do you all know what this is? It's the idea that whenever a process in the universe encounters a bifurcation point, that it goes both ways. In other words, And and so the multiplication of possibilities in a situation like that is staggering. And I just don't see, I just don't feel the need for it. If I understood Wheeler's mathematics better, I might. But that theory has been around since the middle 70s. And he has a very respected position at Princeton. But he doesn't seem to be able to sway his colleagues, which doesn't mean he's wrong. I'm just saying uh, it it's a bit Baroque for my taste. Well, once beyond the zero point, by definition, novelty must mean the simultaneous realization of, of bifurcations of all sorts. In other words, what ultimate novelty must mean is anything we say it means. Uh, there, are, there are no limitations when novelty soars to infinity. The universe is a series of impediments to the expression of novelty. And when it has overcome all those impediments, there is a flawless, higher dimensional matrix throughout all being, I guess, is how you put it. Yeah. Is there no, that's another can of strings. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's a different thing and more exotic. There's a lot of this stuff going around. You know, 
I am by no means the strangest cat on the block. Is Sky Allen Guth? Have any of you looked at his website? This is a guy who's being paid a salary by MIT, for God's sake. And his thing is all about making universes. And he says we can make universes and put them on the shelf. You know, made this one in February, botched that one in March, and uh, talks about how the ultimate proof of the direction in which modern physics is moving is to make a universe. After all, if, if they begin from an area smaller than the diameter of the hydrogen atom, a major laboratory could just stamp them out like hotcakes. <laughs> of course, the question is, what are they good for? Uh, what do you do with a universe once you've made one? But a, as an exercise in the imagination, I you know take a look at what this guy is into. Uh, let me just try to sum this up, not certainly to sum up the ideas, because the ideas are not really that important. They may be true, they may be untrue, they may reside in a domain where those rules don't apply. The feeling that I hope you take away from all of this, when you are most self-reliant, you know, maybe you don't understand ten-dimensional vector calculus then don't use that tool to understand. Hone the tools that you have and try to create models and understand that all models are provisional. This is the antidote to the idea of ideology. Ideology is, is when you believe something passionately. Models are when you dispassionately attempt to define the operation of a system, and the word model implies that you are perfectly willing to discard the model when a better model comes along. I mean, get a grip, people. Where is it writ in adamantine that talking monkeys should be able to understand the universe? If you met a termite who told you that he was on a quest to understand the universe, a certain lip-curling cynicism would <laughs> ensue. Well, do you think you're better positioned than that termite to undertake that? So the thing is to understand what one understands and then to build outward from that. And the tools are mathematics, drugs, attention to phenomena intuition, community, and inspiration. And uh, these things may not solve your marital problems or uh, increase your earning power, but they will put you in touch with the larger dynamic of being. I think being is most appreciated when it is understood. That's why worship raises my hackles. Worship is, is what animals do to the mystery because they can't assimilate or understand it if they even deal with it at all. But true religiosity is a man is, is uh, signified by honest intellectual efforts to model and understand. And it's by that process that we increase um, our connectivity to the universe and the depth and richness of our connectivity to our community. That's what it really is all about. That's our glory, to understand, to model, to describe, to explore, to appreciate. So. Meet me at the waterfall at the top of the river. Thank you very much. Hey there, thanks for listening. Wizards of Word is a passion project of mine, and every like, comment, and subscribe really helps the channel out. If you enjoy this video or get something from it, please consider smashing that like button or giving a subscribe. I'd really appreciate it. Thanks.